1926, Jumping Jacks with Outside, recorded in about 1927, I think. And that uh, was one of Harry Ruiz's band. We tend to uh, favour that band. I like the sound, like the compressed sound of those light ray recordings from the uh, late mid to late 20s while they were trialling that process for copyright reasons. All right, so we've got a few things lined up for tonight. And I, again, apologies if I'm... Um, if I'm interfering with that uh, QSO down the band a little bit, I've moved up as high as I can, and um, I hope there's no uh, no one's caught in the uh, uh, caught up in the uh, the high frequency sounds. Right, so let's see what is next in line. Oh yeah, okay. I I was going to have a little bit of another another Bix Fix affair, <laughs> Bix Fest because there have been uh, some remarkable transfers uploaded late. Uh, I'm getting tongue-tied tonight. This, there have been a number of remarkable transfers uploaded lately, including uh, some from the Wolverine Orchestra, which is uh, sort of Bix's entrant into the uh, jazz idiom. That's where the first recordings were made with the Wolverines, and uh, including a... Um, a recording of a song called Oh Baby, recorded in 1924 with the Wolverines. Now, this is a particularly special song. He's um, uh, This is before he developed his distinctive style based on his, uh, I should say, obsession with French Impressionist music. Lots of whole tone scales and sort of uh, uh, unusual rhythmic characterizations based on Impressionism, the way he uh, used hemiolas and offset the rhythm and stuff. But early days, he was much more conventional as a trumpet player, and you can hear these more or less mimicking uh, Louis Armstrong, but with lots of uh, inventiveness, and you can hear the signatures of Bix. So early Bix recording from 1924, VK3SL. <laughs> Okay, whoa, it's got to the mic in time. Big Spiderbeck and uh, the Wolverine Orchestra from 1924 with a song called Oh Baby. They made quite a few records, the Wolverines, and then he had the Swiss, Swiss City Six and a few other bands before he uh, joined Gene Colgate's orchestra uh, for a period and then moved on to the Whiteman, um, the Whiteman Umbrella because <laughs> there were so many groups under the auspices of Mr. W., and that's what we're going to hear now. We're going to move... Okay, oh, shall I do that now? 
I reckon I will do something first because last week we had it, what, two weeks ago and I was last testing, we had a bit of a tribute to Mr Goldberg. That's Max Goldberg, a trumpet player who featured in a lot of British dance bands, particularly Ray Noble and Ambrose. Played with those orchestras for a long period, but he also did session work with countless other bands, and uh, including this one, which I just dug up. So it's called a group called the Rhythmic Eight, and I'm pretty sure he's on this. So I will have to find my way across to the other side of the bench here, and hopefully the iron dent will be a little bit more continuous. This is VK3SL, testing on 160 metres, 2 metres, and the Broadwave streaming service. And that was a real 78, a Zonophone, featuring the Rhythmic 8 with I'm Crazy Over You. And I think that does feature Mr Goldberg in that recording. We heard an interview with uh, Max Goldberg last week, and uh, it was, I found that particularly interesting. I listened to it a few times because there's a lot of detail in that interview which uh, one can reference in relation to the later recordings of... Um, uh, Ray Noble and Ambrose in particular and there's a lot of anecdotal uh, information there so yes so this is a test transmission on 160 meters and 2 meters on 147.475 testing on two frequencies so it's a chance to uh, flex the muscles of the equipment here and we use modulated sound for these tests um, nothing to do with entertainment whatsoever and I stress that strictly non-entertainment uh, yeah, so in the vein of um, of completely uh, boring the listener senseless, we're going to uh, have another selection from Paul Whiteman now. 
Um, doesn't bore me senseless. This in, in, inspires me. It's amazing to hear these transfers. So Mr. Prozert, he's been very active and he's been working with the uh, the Paul Whiteman ba- potato head label, the Columbias, that he made after May 1928. He moved to Columbia then. There's a famous film of him tearing up the Victor contract when he moved to Columbia. And... Um, and it was really the golden period with Whiteman. It's the time when uh, he had uh, a star-studded lineup, including Bix and uh, Frankie Trembauer and Bill Rank and lots of others. Because some great soloists in the band. And um, anyhow, but uh, Mr. Prozit's done a fab job in uh, in reinvigorating those recordings, bring them to life. And they've always been a tiny bit muffled compared to the Victors. The Columbias have never, to my ears, sounded quite as good, although they're, um, they're laminated pressings. Um, the uh, the actual quality of the engineering is not quite as good, I don't think. That's my impression. But he's done really well in sort of opening up the sound. And uh, I commend the latest uploads to anyone interested in Mr. Prozut because he does, he does discuss... The, uh, there's a bit of dialogue with someone who sort of uh, makes an oblique criticism of uh, people who um, who transfer the sound I- with modern equipment, and he makes a very strong defence in favour of preserving 78s without wrecking them with steel needles. And, of course, we um, all know that uh, Mr. prozit has got access to a... Uh, um, a virgin collection, essentially, a collection of records which had never been played. So um, it's a unique situation, to say the least. Anyhow, the latest upload is a, uh, a selection from 1928. Now, there's four songs here, but I'll, I'll see how we go. I might just sort of make a comment here or there, but I'll let them run. More or less. The first one's Out of Town Gal. Then we hear Taint So. It's an early Crosby. In fact, I think all these are Crosby's. Uh, Out of Town Girl's Rhythm Boys, Taint So's Bing. Next one is Oh Miss Hannah, which is, which is a personal fave of mine. And um, I really love, love the arrangement there. And uh, there's another one as well on the list. I'll have to have a look. Let's see. Uh, Miss Hannah, and then Because My Baby Don't Mean Maybe Now. That's another one with the Rhythm Boys. Oh, yeah, and there's I cry, I'll, um, I'd Rather Cry of You. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. I don't know if we'll get to five. <laughs> Might play two or three. Anyhow, I'll back announce them. Um, have a listen for the big solos. Every track features a big solo. They're always interesting. He's adventurous and with the fairly conservative, well, I wouldn't say the arrangements are that conservative for their time. They're quite uh, liberated, quite progressive. But Bix's solos are just out of this world and he's really moving into completely new territory in the way that he stretches the rhythm and uses his whole tone scales and chromatic influences and... Um, expressive intonation and uh yeah look you'll hear them yeah so big solos abound and it sort of breaks out of the uh the, the stricter structural frameworks of the whiteman arrangements but this is the golden era as far as i'm concerned the time when whiteman engaged bill Shallis, who was a genius really he was the arranger for the band and we have these early crosby recordings and crosby makes such a great jazz singer it's a pity he sort of got stuck into crooning Full time <laughs> from the 30s onwards, uh, but these records he made in the 20s as a young man, I uh, just give you uh, uh, display a fabulous sense of rhythm. And um, yeah, so we'll have a listen to the first one's Out of Town Girl of Mine. So here we go Mr. Prozit's realization of the ba- uh, Potato Head Paul Whiteman records from 1928, a selection of them now. VK3 SL testing. <laughs> Hello, hi ho, come let's hop again, let's get into your 
thing we can print. That's all meter, there's no one sweeter I know, but da 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 You can rave and shout about your gals in town. Wait till you see that out of town gal of mine, of mine. They don't make them sweeter than sweet Mary Brown. Wait till you see that out of town gal of mine. Right now you think I'm not a smarty. But wait and hesitate until you see that certain party. Imagine Venus dressed in a blue gingham gown. Wait till you see that out of town gal Look up, brother, and I'm sure you will see. Taint so, honey, taint so. The devil said yes, but the Lord said no. Taint so, honey, taint so. Yeah, we've been listening to a selection of recordings from Paul Wypen's orchestra made in 1928, just after the period where he moved to Columbia from Victor. It was a big move, and Columbia celebrated Wypen by giving him his own coloured label. Uh, they're called Potato Head Labels because it's got a big picture of Mr. Wypen's face um, flanked by multicolours, and it's sort of the, you know, uh, he, he had that sort of... Um, Currency, I suppose. He was someone with uh, who was who was able, it's like Melba, having her own lilac label. Whiteman had his own multicolour um, special label for Columbia. 
But uh, yeah, um, we just uh, heard Taint So, Honey Taint So. Now that's a Crosby number, but the big solo on that is just amazing. I reckon, I've, I know people probably get sick of me doing this, but I'd like to have another listen to that big solo and I'll just fade in and hear the last little bit of the song and then we'll keep it going because the next song is Oh Miss Hannah and that's a personal fave of mine, but I promise I won't repeat that one. <laughs> so we hear a little bit of Taint So because it's probably one of Bix's most um, outrageous or fascinating solos, I think. And then we'll hear Oh Miss Hannah. And then following that, we can hear Because My Baby Don't Mean Maybe Now, all from 1928. So let's see what I can do about this. This is VK3SL, test transmission, and we are listening to the music of Mr. Whiteman. Here we go. All right, I'll go back a little bit further. And very shortly, we'll hear Mr. Bix. Here we go. Swaying in the breeze Get on your Sunday Go to meet and close And come along please Thank you. 
shining peacefully because my baby don't need baby now. When the preacher questions me, I'll say yes sir, yes siree, because my baby don't need baby now. I just got a little letter just yesterday, and now I feel a little better, and so I say, life is short and mighty sweet, but I know mine is quite complete, because my baby don't need baby now. Okay, we've just heard a selection of songs played by the Paul Whiteman Orchestra in 1928. These are records he made for Columbia shortly after moving to the label in May 28. And uh, we heard Out of Town Girl, Taint So, Oh Miss Hannah, and then Because My Baby Don't Me Maybe Now. And next time we might play, there's a couple more on that uh, on that list there. These are all uploads for Mr. Prozut, who's been very active of late. And for those who have been following Prozut, um, it's well worth having a look at the dialogue underneath the uh, the uh, under each track because he's being a lot more active in contributing to discussions. And it's starting to a little bit more about his personality and his lifestyle and interests are starting to uh, materialise. So it's a it's a quite fascinating to uh, understand the man behind the transfers. I was listening to them here with the uh, leak sandwich speakers which are very good on uh, bass for, for 78s particularly. And uh, it, they, I've never heard those songs sound so clear. Those particular recordings I knew very well from an anthology that my art teacher gave me when I was at high school. And uh, I used to listen to them over and over, but they're always muffle missions. And, um, you know, not you, you really struggle to get um, hear how the, uh, the ensemble really gelled because it was just sort of thickly textured and compressed, but really it teases that out miraculously. And there's, there's grain in the, in the uh, lower frequencies and you can hear the, uh, the instrumental groups and there's a lot more musical information. And I honestly don't know how he does it. He, does, he still hasn't quite given the game away, but he, uh, we know that he uses uh, modern equipment. But I'd have to say he may be using a moving coil cartridge and... Um, finding a, uh, a stylus fit that's just perfect for unplayed records and uh, and something I wouldn't surprise me is using uh, intelligent EQ because uh, I just it, it's unfathomable how clear they sound for that period so hats off to Mr. Prozut we look forward to his uploads and they've been very prolific of late this is a test transmission on 160 meters and relaying on two meters and also there's a streaming service uh, if anyone wants to go to my uh, QRZ page, you'll find a link to the streaming service, and I use the uh, Broadwave uh, protocol. It's a software package that seems to stream okay, and a few people listen on the stream each week, so that can be found by looking at my QRZ page. So that's the story. These are test transmissions which occur each Friday night, so I give the uh, Stretch the legs a little bit of the transmitter and the associated processing equipment here, and it's an opportunity to explore modulated sound via historic recordings, historic recordings which need to be played. They yearn to be played. Uh, all right, we'll have another one of, um, uh, of Prozutes now. This is something that's equally as astonishing, and it's it's actually quite a bit later. This We jump forward to 1943. Now, I personally have never been much of a fan of Frank Sinatra. I've always sort of, I've never really enjoyed his singing much at all, uh, particularly his later recordings. He was always singing out of tune. Just, he's always had a fantastic sense of rhythm. There's absolutely no doubt about that, and a great musical line in his earlier stuff. But the grain in his voice and the um, uh, character of his voice never really did it for me uh, until I heard this recording from 1943, a very early Sinatra. He's in his 20s, early 20s. And uh, it's from a radio broadcast. It's a test. And he's playing with Axel Stordahl's orchestra. And it's off a sort of a, a air check or something. It's an interesting one. 
Um, there's a big story behind this too, but I'll leave people to do their own research. If you look up the Prozert's offerings from this week, you'll see it there. And uh, in it, there's a bit of... Uh, uh, debate about what's really going on here. But anyhow, uh, Frank Sinatra actually um, announces it, and uh, I've never, ever heard him sing this well. I've heard a couple of his recordings he made from the, with uh, Tommy Dorsey around about this period, and they're quite good, but I've never really had a chance to hear the early um, Sinatra, which sort of leads me to think that he uh, burnt his voice out at a very young age. But uh, anyhow, this is uh, quite fascinating, I find. So I don't usually go this late. This is modern for me after the uh, 1943. Gosh. And as I speak, I'm watching ants crawl out of the faders here. We've had an ant invasion here, and there are ants everywhere, and they're just coming out of everything. So somehow in the circuitry there are ants wandering around. I wonder if there are any ants in the, in warming themselves up by the 807s. I wonder. All right, let's have a listen to Mr. Sinatra, and he announces this, and uh, let's see what's happening here. VK3SL, I'm testing. Hello, Virginia. This is Frank Sinatra speaking. I'm awfully sorry that you couldn't come to lunch with me Thursday, but your dad said the doctor wanted you to stay in bed a little longer. But I hope you're well enough to return to Douglas School for the opening. Right now, we're over here at the rehearsal for the Lucky Strike show, and while we're here, I thought maybe I'd like to do a tune for you. So, Ginny, here it is, and I hope you like it. Won't you tell me when we will meet again Sunday, Monday, or always If you're satisfied, I'll be at your side Sunday, Monday, or always To tell me now what makes the world go round When at the sight of you my heart begins to pound and pound What am I to do? Can't I be with you? Sunday, Monday Tell me when we will meet again Sunday, Monday, or always If you're satisfied, I'll be at your side Sunday, Monday, or always To tell me now what makes the world go round When at the sight of you my heart begins to pound and pound And what am I to do? Can't I be with you Sunday, Monday, or always? Well, Ginny, good luck, honey. See you next time I get to California. My best wishes to your brother Freeman. And get well soon, won't you? God bless you. Goodbye. Okay, that was an ear check from um, Frank Sinatra from 1943. Absolutely glorious and amazing arrangement. And uh, lo uh, plenty of detail in that recording too. Very, very fine for that time. So what's next, we wonder. So it's great uh, providing lots of good source material for me in uh, doing these test transmissions, for sure. 
Okay, last time, last time, last time we had a selection of, we had a little Boswell Sisters. I played a Boswell Sisters track, I think it was Roll on Mississippi. Then I played a recording of um, one of Kate's ensembles from early 90s singing the same song. Same, she arranged it from the song. Well, I found another one. And uh, so we'll have a listen first to the Boswell Sisters 1932 singing Crazy People. And then we'll hear... Uh, the choir called the Melbourne Vocal Ensemble um, in 1990, I think it was, singing the same piece in a sort of contemporary arrangement, but pretty much the same. So back to back. Have a listen to Crazy People. This is from a film called The Big Broadcast in 1932, VK3SL. Mm -hmm. No big broadcast would be quite complete without those three little girls from New Orleans. Permit me to present the Boswell sisters, Connie, Vet, and Martha. Crazy people, crazy people, crazy like me, go crazy, oh, be like you. Go big people, devil people, devil people like me, go crazy over things you do. While we are underneath the moon, the moon above, you've got me acting just like a loon, it must be love. Now jump ahead 60 years and here's the same song. <coughs> Oops. Oh, why did that happen? Try it again. Crazy people. Crazy people. Crazy people. Crazy people like me. Go crazy over people like you. Groovy people. Thank you. 
Yes, we just heard the Melbourne Vocal Ensemble from 1990, I think, 1990, 1991. And that was a splinter group from the Ormond Choir. Kate used to sing in the Ormond Choir and they formed a contemporary group to sing at corporate functions and things. And they uh, did, uh, or Kate made the arrangement of that and a few other Boswell Sisters songs. And I just happened to find a cassette of one of their performances when I was cleaning up the other day, so it's nice to sort of hear them in sharp relief, the two versions of Crazy People. The former, the one with the Boswell sisters, is from a film called The Big Broadcast. It's actually a movie, and uh, you see them with a huge microphone in front of them, the big carbon mic, and um, it's a delight to behold. It's great to see them actually perform. They're so animated. Um, okay, so th uh, we'll just click off that one. We won't save the file because it's been done. And we'll see what's next, what's next, what's next, what's next. Um, oh, I was going to do an OTR segment, but um, uh, because I was well, in the cleanup, I'm switching on the cart machines as I speak. In the, uh, in the cleanup, I found some carts, holding another box of carts under the house. So let's have a listen. Let's see what's here. What's this one? Oh. I don't think we need that one. Uh, I'll try a different one. Oh, this is fun. I'll put this one. Have a listen to this. This is from 3KZ, I think. Darling, mm -hmm. how would you like to choose from hundreds of whole rolls of the most exciting carpets in Melbourne? Oh. Colours brilliant, patterns beautiful, oh. prices practical. Oh, honey, where is this fabulous place? Honey, Kate's Carpetland is not a place, it's places, seven places. Oh, where are these places? Where do you live? Oh, I, I haven't started living yet. We'll start now at one of these places. Mm -hmm. Mulgrave, 752 Springvale Road. Moorabbin, 871 Nepean Highway. Nutter Wadding, 335 Whitehorse Road. Oh. Frankston, 30 Young Street. Dandenong, 217 Princess Highway. Footscray, 190 Barclay Street. Oh. And July. Long 115 High Street in Belmont. Oh, I just started. That finished very abruptly. <laughs> uh, these are fun. Um, I'll shove another one in, another cart machine. What's this one? There's Ford West Shopping Town. We're on your side. We're on your side. Ah, oh, it was short. I might fast forward through. Let's see if there's anything else on that one. Um, all right, we'll just keep going through this. This one's Myers. Let's have a listen to this. Hey, guess what I've just found in the Meyer Christmas sale catalogue? I give in. Miss Melbourne. T-shirts with stripes, plain T-shirts, all over prints, dip dyed ombres for $3, $4 and $5. That sounds OK. And over here on page 17, there's a terrific range of men's knit shirts. Really? How much? Oh, only $3.99. Oh, wow. If you're looking for fashions or presents or things for the house, the Meyer Christmas sale catalogue is well worth looking into. And the Meyer Christmas sale's on right now at all Meyer stores. Okay, here's another one. There's Fort West Shopping Town. We're on your side. We're on your side. Oh, that's okay. That's all there is on that one. Let's see what else is here. Ah, oh, can I get them in the right spot? Hmm, oh, this one doesn't sound too good. I think the uh, the the uh, pad's gone on this one. So that goes in the bin. I'll put it aside. I might dub these off like Mr. Stu did. Um, what else, what else, what else? I'll try this one here. <laughs> oh, this one's got nothing on it either. Well, we might have to preview a little bit more comprehensively, I think. We'll see what happens. Stop, play. 
No, nothing on that one. Take that out. Since there's football match, that'll be fun. Bloody football. It's all going to start again, folks. Back to football season. This Saturday, 3KZ covers the 1975 Grand Final Replay. Join Jack Dyer and yours truly, Ian Major, from 1.15 on 1180 Radio for all the uninterrupted action of kangaroos and hawks. Australia's top football panel will be at the other grounds to keep you informed of all the highlights in the second round of the 76th season. It's brought to you on 3KZ by Carlton and United Breweries. All right, we'll make that our segment for today. I'll go through this. There's a whole box of them. I'll go through the others and see if I can find anything of interest rather than just sort of... Uh, pick them out at random. I did hear that Kai Carpet one. I think that is pretty classic. Um, yeah, so there we go. That's our OTR segment. And we'll have to keep moving because I had a few classical things lined up. It's been an interesting week, actually, because um, I'm, you might remember me mentioning that we had a visit from John Hanna, who's a record collector in Sydney. Now, John came down to Melbourne and stayed with Mr. L and uh, or visited Mr. L. And when they came out here and we were playing 78s all afternoon and talking shop, which is something I don't usually get to do on that riff on that subject. And uh, he's uh, he's a really quite a, a dedicated collector. And he's taking the is recently taken the initiative of putting some of his rarer recordings up on YouTube. He's been quite inspired by a number of other people who've done the same, and um, so it's exciting because he's on, upon returning to Sydney, he's just put up heaps and heaps of really rare classical recordings, and he's done a fab job. They sound really good, and um, so it's it's great initiative. And I'm going to follow suit and start putting up classical stuff soon. In fact, I might piggyback off it off some of his playing some uh, uh, uploading some of the same artists so there can be a bit of inertia you never know it might even get three or four hits so you know this is exciting stuff we're, we're hitting the big time here but one of the recordings is an artist I've always wanted to hear and it, it's it's one of the and one of those sort of remarkable Australian stories that's you know there's so many tales like this um, I haven't got the specifics of the biographical information, so I'm just riffing on this, but uh, there was a chap called Edward Goll, who was a piano teacher at the Con. He taught at the Melbourne Conservatorium. And um, he, I knew, I used to know an old lady. In fact, I think she's still alive, uh, Judy Hall. I think she's nearly 100. But she studied with Edward Goll in the 40s. And uh, she used to talk about him. I used to ask her about him. And he was an extraordinary gentleman. He could play all Bach's 48 Preludes and Fugues in any key at the drop of a hat. He had the ability to... He had such incredible musicianship that he could basically play any piece in any key. And uh, But uh, that that's just such an astonishing achievement. She said that uh, it was overwhelming uh, to be around with around someone with that sort of gift. Well, how he ended up in Australia is interesting. He came out as an accompanist to an artist. Now, as I said, I don't have the biographicals, so I just understand he came out as an accompanist in 1910 out to Australia, and he fell in love with someone out here and decided to stay. And then that's it. He became a part of the Australian musical establishment. But prior to that, he'd been a very celebrated musician in Europe. He'd had a huge career, a meteoric career. And he was a student, interestingly, of Dvorak. Now, that's really significant because uh, Dvorak only had a few students. And, uh, and people might know that Dvorak is the, probably the greatest Czech composer and one of the great luminaries of 19th century um, romantic com uh, music. So, but Mr. Goll, as a child, studied with Dvorak and um, in the 1890s. So it's, it's just incredible to think that someone with that heritage was present on the Australian scene. Now, Edward Gull, before he, uh, he went back to Europe a couple of times in the 20s, and on one of those trips he made some records for Brunswick. They're incredibly rare. Um, I've never seen any. But uh, John had one in his collection, and he's put it up online, and I'm completely blown away. I think it's just the most amazing piano playing. In fact, it's um, uh, I I think it's sort of in a class of its own. He plays the um, uh, a piece which we had to sort of identify. I knew it straight away because it's actually a uh, from one of Bach's violin uh, partitas. But we had to establish the transcription, and it's actually a transcription by Bach himself. 
from a, I think, a suite or a, a small sort of um, uh, uh, um, set of pieces. And it's an allegro. It's in D minor, so we satisfy the minor key element. And he's playing staccato, but have a listen. If you listen carefully, there are so many shades of staccato. It's incredible. And the way he voices the different... Um, the, the different musical lines and the, the way he shapes his staccato, I think it leaves Glenn Gould for dead. Now, Glenn Gould's the greatest staccato man I've ever heard until now. <laughs> There's actually recordings also of Busoni who exhibiting incredible ability to play staccato. But well, this takes the takes the cake, I think. So we'll hear this. It's a um, there's two little there's two pieces. The first one's this Allegro in D minor, which architecturally is I think a miracle. And then he plays a courant, uh, um, which has got, again, beautiful sense of musical line. It's not so staccato. But I will follow the Allegro with another recording of it afterwards. So we'll just, like, get ahead of myself here. We'll just hear one thing at a time. So the the uh, pianist is Edward Goll, uh, G-O-L-L. -L, and we'll hear the Allegro in D minor, BWV 964. It's actually a transcription of BWV... Uh, 2002, uh, 2003, I think. Yes, one of the violin partitas. Anyhow, subclause upon subclause, <laughs> back to Mr. Goal. We're hearing the Allegro and have a listen to this playing. It, it's totally astonishing. VK3 SL testing. <laughs> Yeah, we heard two recordings from Edward Gold, who was born in 1884 and died in 1949. And he lived a greater part of his life in Australia. 
and he uh, worked at the con for quite some time uh, from wartime onwards and um we heard the uh, Bach's Allegro in D minor, BWV 964, and also his Courant in A major, BWV 824. So two works by J.S. Bach featuring the astonishing pianism of Edward Gohl. And uh, what uh, what an amazing story that is. It's had, a, it's had five views this week. Isn't that incredible? Five views for something so amazing. Well, the Allegro in D minor... Um, I think architecturally is incredibly interesting the way he plays that. Another recording of that very same piece from the uh, famous um, Bach Sonata Number no. Two, the BWV One Double O Three, it is, um, is a, a recording is a recording of that work by Anescu, which it registers very highly in my esteem. People are sort of uh, probably a little bit uh, um, used to me waxing lyrical about Anescu. <laughs> <laughs> another another artist with profound insights, but um, here's another version of that same piece, which is very knowing and again characterized by um, by the way you know, by the way he colors the voices and the way the voices interplay. It's just so much in this piece. It's incredible. So we'll hear Nescu. Now Nescu is well past his prime here, but in a way, he throws. Uh, that's a good thing because he throws caution to the wind and he doesn't care about mistakes and he just plays with utter musical conviction and his musicianship completely transcends the the failing technique. But uh, it's there's so so much musically in this performance of the same work by. George Enescu in the same year, actually. No, oh, no, 1949, not the same year. It's the year the gold died. Anyhow, Mr. Enescu.
the, embo the emboldened protean playing of Georgianescu uh, playing Bach's um, uh, uh, the Allegro from Bach's Sonata Number no. Two BWV One Double O Two, and um, it's just amazing how the uh, those lines usurp each other at the end. That sense of musical architecture, and it, I love hearing players which when they're sort of on the way out in a way, but um, their musical message is still really, really clear. And the fact that they're not trying to be careful means that you just get something that's full of risks and incredible uh, excitement. It's the way music should be, I think. Um, too much careful playing around. When you hear playing like that, it's just it's so incredibly exciting. So, yes, I thought it would be a nice one little uh, compliment to the uh, recording of Edward Gold playing the same piece. Um, now, what, um, I should... Uh, refer to John Hanna's site for those who are interested in following it. You never know, he might even get uh, f six views on some of these uploads. It's called Vintage Sounds. That's the name of the site, Vintage Sounds. And um, uh, you can hear he's, uh, he's put up about 20 records in the last week. So celebrating Mr. Hanna and his initiatives. It's a lot of work and he's done a great job and he's certainly fleshed out the stories really well and uh, bringing these artists to life because they're not really very well re um, represented anywhere online and um, it's it, it takes it, it takes care and time to do that so um, and I'm delighted with his transfers he doesn't over process he just basically puts them up raw for people to um, culture to their to their own liking okay another one now we'll hear the great Spanish cellist Gaspar Casado who's a personally a favorite cellist of mine I love, love uh, Casado's playing as much as I love Casals's playing and he's going to play the even song uh, by Schumann another beautiful lyrical performance very eloquent performance this time Mr. Casado <laughs> Yeah, what an amazing sense of line. That was Gaspar Casado playing the cello. He was performing Even Song by Schumann. That was recorded in 1928. And, um, yeah, I particularly 
have um, in particular like uh, Casado's playing he had uh, he had that same sort of uh, diction element that um, the Casals had in fact he was a student of Casals for a period in the uh, early part of the century he was Casals's only student until um, in his early days and um, you, you can hear that Casals's influence because the music speaks as well as as sings it's just uh, uh, that uh, syllabic was it syllabic diminuendos <laughs> Okay, we move on and we'll hear another recording from uh, Mr. Vintage Sounds, aka John Hanna. And we have Michelle Perastro this time. Uh, now, Michelle Perastro was a Lee Palau student, and uh, Lee Palau was the pre preeminent Russian teacher at St. Petersburg, St. Petersburg um, Conservatory in the early days of the 20th century, 19th century, no, 20th century, and uh, and he had many famous students, including Yasha Heifetz and Misha Elman and uh, oh, a host of others. Uh, Milstein was another one of our students, but um, Prestro was as well, the artists we're about to hear. Prestro, um, he could have done anything, really, with his career, but he decided to become a concertmaster of the San Francisco Orchestra and then later on the New York Phil. So he sort of held the principal, probably the, the most prestigious orchestral positions at the time. And uh, he lived from 1891 to 1970. Astonishing player. And, uh, and he plays the Carnival Rus by Vinyaski here in 1928. It's on a, a, a Brunswick, pretty rare record. It's had a phenomenal two views, this one. And uh, you'll hear him at the end. One of those views I played <laughs> was me playing it to a work colleague at work today. Her violin teacher, Earl Violin, is a well-known player in Melbourne. And um, because there's a technique towards the end of this, it's a virtuoso piece, and he does this high-speed, like, spasm trill. And I've never heard that technique played by anyone, and we were sort of marvelling at the uh, how the heck he did it. So it's something um, interesting. You'll hear it towards the end. It's in the last variation. It's like a super-fast uh, tremolo, but it must be like a spasm tremolo. That's, what, that's how we surmised and surmised it so well uh, yeah wonder what you think anyhow we'll have a listen to michel perestro from 1928 this is vk3 sl <laughs> Thank you. 
how's that for a virtuoso? You hear that sort of that um, that trill in the last variation, that, that incredibly intense sound. I've never heard that done by anybody else. And I recall hearing that recording in a violin anthology, and and that was um, marveled on, was that technique. So uh, interesting to hear Mr. Perastro. And, uh, yeah, he made the choice not to be a soloist, but to to work as a concert master for the... Uh, for the American orchestras, but um, there are a lot of stories about him, and uh, I think a lot of soloists who played with those orchestras were quite intimidated by it because they knew that the uh, concert master was probably a better player than they were. He lived until 1970, so um, he um, he certainly had a long career, but that recording made in 1928. So yes, um, okay, it's getting close to one o'clock. All right, I'm going to change gear now. We'll change gear. We'll have a listen to something contemporary. I'm sort of trying to inhabit a more contemporary music zone. I'm going through my old uni notes and and um, and challenging myself to to listen to music that um, that I wouldn't otherwise listen to. So, but this is pretty accessible actually because I'm going to play some minimalist music and we're going to hear some Steve Reich and very ex- very um, accessible music, but uh, and very hypnotic. So this might actually send people a bit off to sleep. Um, some I'm going to play some of his phase music. He played. He wrote quite a few pieces where um, the music's slightly out of phase between different sections of the ensemble, and you get all these sort of offset rhythms start to occur, and it actually plays with your brain. So be prepared. It might sort of uh, set, take you somewhere. It might drive you nuts. It might make you switch off. I don't mind. But um, see what you think. You may have even heard it. The first one is uh, famous clapping music, which I've actually participated in this before. And, uh, uh, yeah, so it involves just a very, very simple rhythm, which is clapped singularly first, and then someone else plays exactly the same rhythm, but one half a beat late. And then the next one's another half a beat late, and it's layered up, and it creates all of these sort of wonderful, remarkable offsets. So it's just a, it's a percussion piece, but with a very interesting use of rhythm with just the same, I think it's just the same rhythmic cell which has just been displaced. So see what, see what, it, uh, see what you think of this. Steve Reich's clapping music, and I think he wrote this about 1972 or something. This is VK3SL testing. Ah, it takes a moment for this one to fire up. Gives us a little introduction for two performers, 1972.
I wonder how that worked with the uh, with the uh, echoey acoustic there. <laughs> it, um, there are v other versions of it with uh, in a dry acoustic which may have come through better. But basically, both parts are playing the same thing, but one's one slightly offset. Each uh, there's a constant sort of uh, displacement in relation to the first line. So it's an interesting one to look at on the score, but it's just about um, um, e extra beats thrown in, but the same rhythmic cell. So um, that was uh, Steve Reich's clapping music, one of his phase pieces. He wrote another one too called f uh, Piano Phase, and he wrote some Marimba Phase. Um, but I thought I'd put this one on. This goes for a while. <laughs> <laughs> um, so sit back. It's very hypnotic. But it has a similar effect, but with greater complexity. So, yeah, it's called Steve Reich's Piano Phase. Now, when did he write this? 1967, I think. So, see what you think. I think uh, Mr. Um, Yaroslav Kovarczyk would quite like this one here, because it has a very ambient effect. Anyhow, see what you think. VK3SL testing, and I'm going to close my eyes and see what this does to me.
we heard Piano Phase for two pianos written by Steve Reich in 1968. Well, I put the pillow on the floor and closed my eyes and it was quite a sonic experience, I have to say. I don't know if you felt the same, but um, that sort of phase music can be quite hypnotic. And there's a lot more where it came from. Steve Reich was a uh, master of exploring that idiom. So, yeah, quite an indulgence. 20 minutes of the same five notes. To finish then, I think we'll have a uh, something. Like we can't go backwards after that. But I thought it would be nice to play something, uh, early work of Olivia Messier, and um, this is a work he wrote for the uh, for the On Martino, the very early electronic uh, instrument, the oscillator, and uh, where you vary the uh, amplitude by moving your hands around a wire. Uh, it was invented in the 1920s, I think, and it's an instrument that Messier explored a lot. Now, this piece is an early work of Messier's. It's called Oraison. And it's a work that he actually explored further for his quartet for the end of time. He actually um, reappropriated this movement. I can't remember which movement it is from the quartet, but it's one of those. Um, I think it's the praise. Yes, it says yes. The praise of the eternity of Jesus, the fifth of the eight uh, of eight movements of the quartet, end of time. Well, he, that was written when he was in a concentration camp. But this is prior to that time. And um, so, yeah, in its earlier incarnation. So it's written for the um, for the On Martino and uh, an inter interesting instrument. And it goes for about six, seven minutes. And then I'll switch on two meters. And if there's anyone standing still, <laughs> I'm happy to, happy to have a chat. And I noticed there's still a QSO going da on down below. Um, I was having a look uh, earlier on on the SDR until it timed out. I've done had my 90 minutes worth. But, um, yeah, thank you for your indulgence. Hang in there for the long show, if you have. See what you think of this piece. And, um, yeah, we should be right here on for each Friday. I've finished with holidays now. Back to the grind, back to reality. But I've got a little bit more breathing space this year than I had last year. So hopefully more time for hobbies. That's the plan. All right, let's hear some early messian from 1937. This is VK3SL saying cheers for now and I'll listen back a bit later. <laughs> <laughs> 